نترك البرنامج هذه الليله ان شاء الله باداره الامه وبمشاركاتهم ان شاء الله فنرحب بالاخ طالب او الشيخ طالب بيلقاء اول محاضره نستقبله بالصلاه على محمد وال محمد. state of Victoria in Melbourne for the Shia community. So for us this is very exciting to be able to have a program in this masjid and um, inshallah uh, after we'd say Ahmad Hakim gives a talk, he'll talk about the significance and the importance of having a masjid inshallah. And it's a great thing and a great initiative that we find from our community leaders to actually have a masjid for our community. The importance of just saying that we have a masjid is something really important. I mean, myself growing up as a young Shia youth in this country, to go around and see that the other sects within the religion of Islam, they had their masjid and we only had Husayniyat. We didn't have masjid. That was hard. That was hard. They would ask, oh, where do you go? I go to the Islamic center in Fulan and Fulan. They say, don't you have a masjid? I go, we have something like a masjid. It was hard. But Alhamdulillah, with the barakat, the barakat from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and from the Ahlul Bayt, salam, now we have our first masjid, Alhamdulillah. And uh, I would ask everyone to recite for, for the blessing and the reward of those who took this initiative, Allah salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So, if we look at the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi, he is that method, he is that example for us. He is what we need to take, his example and put it in our lives. As the Quran says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا so those of you, or there is for you in the Prophet of God, are the best example. So we need to look at the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And whatever, whatever he did within his life, then we need to implement that within our life. So when we see or read his history, we need to put that within our life. So, if we have a look at the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, what we see is this. When it comes to Medina, or his migration to Medina. Now beforehand, we know, he was living in Mecca, there were kuffar, you know, there was that battle at the time of him trying to establish Islam. So at that time, in Mecca, he was there just to establish the religion of Islam. So if you go and open the Holy Quran, anywhere you read in the Quran, where the ayat of the Quran speak about Tawheed, speak about Nabuwa, speak about Mi'ad, anything like this, we know that this chapter is a, a Meccan chapter of the Quran. 
Because at the time in Mecca, Rasulullah was trying to sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, establish the religion of Islam. Then, if we go to the chapters that have the hukum or the fiqh or the rules regarding the religion of Islam, we see and we call those chapters, the majority of the time we say they are madani chapters. So for example, you see a lot of the ahkam when it comes to marriage is found in Surah An-Nisa for example. So we know that that chapter was revealed in Medina and so on and so forth. So when it comes to looking at our religion and how we should practice our religion, what we should do, we need to look a lot at the segment of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he arrived in Medina. So we see that when he arrived in Medina al or as it was known back then, in Yathrib, the first thing that he actually did, or one of the first actions he did, was begin construction of the Masjid. Right? So when he gets to Medina, or to Yathrib, what does he do? He begins, what? The construction of the Masjid. Because there needs to be a Masjid for the Muslims. And that masjid was, just wasn't a place for worship. The masjid that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi had built wasn't just a place for worship, but it was also a place for the seeking of knowledge. For the seeking of knowledge. So, let's have a look at a hadith. One day, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he comes, he comes to uh, the masjid. And he sees two groups of people. He sees one group of people, they are praying, and doing acts of worship, and he sees another group of people, they are busy in discussing the science of, sciences of the religion. They're discussing Islam and Hukam and things like this. So someone asked him, Ya Rasulullah, which is better? And he says, both of them are good, but he went and sat with those discussing Islam. Now, when you come to a masjid, your talk in a masjid should only be about what? About Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Learning about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Doing all these things. So we see when it comes to the religion of Islam, one of the most important factors within the religion of Islam is the gaining of knowledge. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So seeking knowledge in the religion of Islam is a very, very important thing. So if I was to ask anybody in here, that some of the first verses that were revealed, or the first verse that was revealed in the religion of Islam is what? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Iqra. Right? Surah Al-Araq, Iqra, Bismillah ladhi khalaq. Now this is very, very important, because when we look at Islam, for the most part, we say that Islam was not a religion that was spread by the sword. Rather, Islam was a religion that is spread by by what? It is spread by knowledge. So we have a look at knowledge. This is the most important thing. Because there is a hadith by Imam Ali, Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. He says that what? Doing an act of worship without knowledge, it's like you're not doing anything. So if I was to ask someone, you know, why you're praying? And when I'm saying this, it doesn't mean that if you're praying and you don't know, to stop praying. No. When you do this act of worship, when you are praying, for example, and you understand Salah, whether it be the ahkam of Salah, whether it be the philosophy behind praying, understanding why we need to pray. So, for example, if we look in the Quran, it says, Inna salat tanha anil fahshai So, when you have a look at this, just this aspect for a moment, that if we have a look at Salah, that even some of our, of our scholars and mufassirin, they say the word Salah, comes from the same root word as yasla, right? And we know that that means fire. For example, when we read in Surat, uh, Surat Al-Lahab, right? For example, that means fire. So we say, what does that have to do with Salah? It means it is burning any sins between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you start to have a bit of an understanding and a bit of knowledge behind the actions that you do, then what happens from there? Your acts of worship change a little bit. You start to do your acts of worship with a bit more understanding. Then you start saying to yourself, well, that this salah that I am doing, that I am praying, right? It's meant to protect me from al-fahsha'i wa munkar. What's that fahsha'i? From evils and indecencies and wrong acts. So you take care of your salah. You take care of your salah. So we see a hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He says, the ink of a scholar is worth more than the blood of a martyr. 
Now, this is very, very important. Because when we have a look in Islam, Ma'atididim, right? To become a Shaheed has a very, very high place in the religion of Islam. Well, you know, for example, I tell you that when you go overseas and you see someone who is about to become the Shaheed, right? They take him through the through the village, and, and they you know they, they celebrate his martyrdom. But here Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi he's saying that the ink of a scholar, of our ulama, because sometimes we neglect our ulama. And what do I mean by this? You know, our ulama, they sit down and they spend their whole life studying. Our ulama, they sit there, they study 15, 20 years, they become marja deen. Then when they put out a fatwa, we say, hold on, what's this marja talking about? As if we know better. That shaheed that you love so much, know that the ink, the habit of that scholar is worth more than his and we don't give credit to our ulama. Have you ever, I'll tell you for example, I've come up here now to speak 15, 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Now for me to come, I have to look, I have to read, I have to see what hadith I need to use. This takes time. Now can you imagine a scholar who needs to learn every aspect of the Quran, who needs to learn about the hadith, who needs to learn about the Arabic. When Nahu was sarf and all these sort of things, and then he's got to come and to find Istanbul and trying to derive an Islamic law. You think that's easy for them us to come and say, This marja or this scholar, what does he know? Right? We can't say that. We need to respect our ulama because the work, we work here, yeah, we go to work, we come home, we iftar, we maybe come to the masjid, nishtab shai, babarab shu, salah. We watch Musa Salat. These scholars, they don't have time for this. They put their life into learning the religion. So that way, when it comes to us understanding, oh, you know what? I was praying today and I didn't know if I was in the third rak'ah or the fourth rak'ah. So what do I do? Okay, I open that book. Just pray one rak'ah extra of ihtiyat and then and halat al masal. Or I. You know, I was praying and I didn't know where I was. Okay, it says this so much. Now, instead of us repeating our whole salah, we know if going through the works of our ulama who have studied the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, give us the correct hukum to make our life easier. Right? As a matter of fact, when anyone, you know, some people, they, they listen or they like the path of philosophy or fun or, or they go to the scholars and to ask them, you know, what can I do to go to heaven? What can I do to be an ethical person? What can I do to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And the answer usually is what? Just do your halal and haram and you'll be fine. And this halal and the haram, how do we know what it is? We go back to the risala of our ulama. So we see that the ink of a scholar is worth so much more. When we break it down and we think about it, this aspect of knowledge in Islam is extremely important. Extremely, extremely important. So, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi has also said, to sleep having knowledge is better to pray in jahl. So to sleep having knowledge is better for you to pray in your ignorance. Okay, so I'll give you a story. So one day Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is giving a khutbah. And he says that on the day of judgment, there will be people, they will have good deeds as much as the mountain of Tahama. But even so, in spite of this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will order the angels to throw them into the hellfire. So then the people asked, Ya Rasulullah, these people, they didn't pray, they didn't fast. The Prophet said, yes. They used to pray, they used to fast, they even used to do a'mal al-layl. And if we wake up for Salat al-Fajr, these people were doing a'mal al-layl, and Allah is still going to say, put them in the fire. The people asked him why. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that whenever there was something that was haram, they didn't stop to protect themselves from it, and they ran towards it. Why? Because this is a lack of, lack of knowledge. This is a lack, a lack of knowledge. What's the point of you doing these acts of worship if you're not building your knowledge in Islam as well? Right? You know, and, and we have a look that we often enough, 
don't know much. So if, if we just ask simple questions, simple questions to ourselves. So, for example, in, in a couple of months, we'll come to the, maybe about three, four months, we're in the ninth month, end of the ninth month. So we've got about two months, right? Two, three months, uh, three months, I'm fine. Three months, and then we will come to the month of Muharram. What happens in the month of Muharram? We have the Musiba of Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. We come and we sit down and we commemorate the message of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and the tragedy that occurred in Karbala. Billah I ask you, I ask you, how much do we know about the life of Imam al Hussein? Of Imam al Hussein before the 10th of Muharram? How old was Imam Hussein when he got martyred? He was in his 50s. Was what? He was in his 50s. So let's just get one year off. Let's say he was 50 years old, for example. So there's another 49 years of his life we may know nothing about. Because when it comes to Imam al Hussein, nahna we're good. We're good at saying, you know what? He was a tragedy in Karbala and this and that and this and that. But when we open or to see who was Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, uh, then we struggle a little bit. Then we may struggle a little bit. Or if we come and we want to tell someone, look, we have 12 Imams. This is the best one. Right? This is what we say. So when it comes to the Quran, we are lacking knowledge. When it comes to the Ahlul Bayt, we only know two of them Imam Ali and Imam Hussain. If we learn, for example, from the life of Imam Musa al-Qadam alayhi salam, if we learn from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi afdallah salatu salam, our fiqh comes from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Imagine then, you're not just learning about two Imams, you are implementing in your life 12 Imams. Imagine if you knew the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Imagine. We only know a little bit. Here we're only speaking about the Prophet, him creating a masjid, and one of the points of the masjid was seeking knowledge. And from that we've opened a massive discussion. Just from speaking, just a little bit. Just from that little bit of speaking, that's what we've come to know. And when it comes to knowledge, we can talk so much more. We can talk so much more. We can speak about what we know and what we don't know. We can speak about what we are meant to learn. That right now I've realized that, for example, I don't know this about the religion of Islam, and I don't know that about the religion of Islam. But this is why we need to what? Change? Change our perception. And what? Strive in seeking knowledge for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this masjid, this masjid that we have now in Rizal, that we have now in Melbourne, should not just be a place for worship, it should be a place for education as well. Where we come together to learn what? About the religion of Islam. Where we come together to learn what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has left for us. No, they don't. Are the people who don't know and the people who know, are they the same? Mustahid. If right now you want to go and do anything, you go to someone who knows. You wouldn't go up to someone and say, look, I've seen you hang around this person, therefore you must know. You need to learn, right? You know, when, um, when they used to give a title to the Shia, they used to say, Ahlul Dalil, right? The Shia are the people of evidence. Because really, if anyone comes to speak to the Shia about anything, Shia have evidence about everything. You want to speak about the wilayat of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam? The Shia have to this. Right? And this is how we should be in every aspect of our life. Inshallah, I'll just leave it at that. And inshallah, this is something um, for us to basically talk about and to think about and to maybe learn about. So that way, inshallah, we can grow, get knowledge, use this place for benefits. For benefits. These places, yes, we come, we see our brothers, we come, we meet our friends, but let it be beneficial. Because time doesn't really favor anyone, as we know. We've had many in our community who have 
They have come and they have gone, they have left this world, and we are just following them. So inshallah, may it be that um, this masjid, inshallah, which we're very excited to have, and it looks great, mashallah, it does look really great. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward immensely those who took upon themselves this initiative to have this masjid for us in the city of Melbourne. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you immensely. And inshallah, we can work together and as youth, elders, and all of us, so that we can create an educated community. So that our youth can be educated in the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, in the seerah of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhum afdal as salatu as salam, wa akhiru da'wana, and alhamdulillah, al alameen, wa sallallahu ala muhammadim, wa alihi al tahirin. MashaAllah, brother, it was a great speech that highlighted the importance of uh, Masjid and also uh, the knowledge of ulama and how important it is for us to understand that this is not a small thing and we have to take care of and also the knowing of uh, And I would like to say, brother, this mosque, uh, that's right, there are some people who took the responsibility and created that Masjid or bought that Masjid and Alhamdulillah worked hard to make it look like this but they don't own this place. This place is all for everyone. This place, the bait of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, belongs to all of us. And brother, now it's your turn. We want you to implement what you just said now. We have to use this place. We can't use it, we're grown, that's it. We are old enough. So it's your turn now, you have to take the responsibility and you have to do whatever you can do to use this place for knowledge or for ibadah or for everything. And Alhamdulillah, now we have mosque. Alhamdulillah, we can say now we have masjid, but we need to use it. And inshallah, brother, with these voices, with these uh, words, we can go and grow, inshallah, more and more. Now, let's start with Sayyid Ahmad al Hakim, Salati ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. He says, there are three things that will complain to Allah Azza wa Jal on the Day of Judgment. The first thing is a masjid, but not any masjid. A masjid that will be deserted, not used. The people, the people around the masjid, the neighborhood, they don't come and pray in it. That's the first thing. People that don't attend to the masjid, that masjid will complain to Allah The second thing is an alim, a scholar. SubhanAllah, you see, talib, almost identical. The second thing is an alim, a scholar, who is amongst a juhal, the ignorant people. But not the ignorant people that, you know, they don't know, they don't understand, but they want to learn. The ones that insist on being juhal, insist on being ignorant. They want to remain in ignorance. So the second person that will complain is a scholar. The third thing 
is Al Quran. The Quran that is in our homes. The Musnaf. This thing that we have in our homes that is collecting dust. If we have one of these at home and is collecting dust and we don't open it and read it, that also will complain to Allah Azza wa on the Day of Judgment. <coughs> طيب. Let's now analyze this hadith and break it up into a few parts. We see that with everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us as a blessing to reach Him is a furqan. That same thing can be used for our benefit or can be used for our destruction. What do I mean? Let's say a knife. A knife, what can you use a knife for? A knife can be used for something like cutting an orange or cutting bread or something like that. But that same knife, that tool that you can use for good, it can be used for bad, it can be used for evil. You can cut yourself, you can cut someone else. You see in, in Iraq, people are using knives in all sorts of ways, subhanAllah. They're using it for everything except for cutting an orange. But that same thing can be used as a benefit or a detriment, something that can hurt you. But the same thing with everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us as a hujjah. The first of those things is the Qur'an. The first thing is the Qur'an. What do I mean? This Qur'an we read in Surah Al-Baqarah that this month, Shah Ramadan, is only mentioned how many times in the Qur'an? Shah Ramadan is mentioned only once. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Shah Ramadan, الذي أنزل فيه Qur'an. Hudan للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان. You see, it's a furqan as well. Furqan means a criterion, a distinguisher between good and evil. Now it says, Hudan للناس. A guidance for all people. But subhanAllah, this book that we have, even though its intention or its purpose is to guide all of mankind, not everybody takes this Qur'an as a guide. What do I mean? In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, بَعْدًا أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ أَلِفْ لَا مِينَ ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ It is a guidance for المتقين, those who have taqwa, those who have God consciousness, those who are aware in every step and every action they take, they know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching them. Therefore, I have to do something that will please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only those people will take this Qur'an as a guidance. Only those people. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hudan al-Muttaqeen. And then he goes on to describe the second group of people, which is al-Kafirin. And then the third group of people, al-Munafiqeen. This is in Surah al-Baqarah. But the amazing thing is, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives some method. He gives us a few amthal. Amthal means a parable. So what does that mean? For example, about the munafiqeen, he says, the munafiqeen are like those who light up a fire for themselves, but Allah takes away their fire, and He leaves them in darkness. So the munafiqeen, the hypocrites, they try to bring nur to themselves from other means from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, muhitun alil kafirin, He takes away their light. طيب. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about al amthal he says, "Inna Allah la yistahi an yadrab mathala ma baghudatan fama fawqaha." Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "He is not embarrassed. He is not shy to give any example, so that we may understand." Of course, we're very simple people. When we talk about things like, you know, spirituality, metaphysics, it's very difficult for us. To, to grasp these concepts. So what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? Or anyone does. They try to give an example using physical products. For example, al-hijab. Al-hijab. Sometimes people don't understand al-hijab. So what do they say? A woman is like a chocolate. Tayyip? Women are like a chocolate. Now would you like to eat the chocolate that has the wrapper or that doesn't have the wrapper? You say, of course, I want to eat the chocolate that does have the wrapper. You see, that's what hijab is. It's a protection. It's to make you look more attractive, more beautiful, and so on and so forth. Or an iPhone. Why do you put a cover on my iPhone? I have a cover on my iPhone to protect it, to keep it scratch-free, and so on and so forth. Of course, women don't like this. They say, why are you comparing me to chocolate, or why are you comparing me to iPhone? But the point is, is that so we can understand these concepts, 
We say that they like chocolate or like iPhone. And of course, the believing women are much more valuable than that. We cannot put a, a physical product or a physical value upon them. However, these examples are so that we understand because we're so limited. The the the, 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 Arafa, the Arafa, when they try to explain Wahdat al Wujud, they say it's like a candle with mirrors, or they say it's like an ocean with waves. Of course, these all these examples are qasa. They don't do justice to the reality of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, but they try to put it in a simple way. طيب. Now, when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says He's not shy. I'll give you an example of a ba'udah. Ba'udah means, you know, some will translate it like mosquito. Some will translate it as a gnat. Some will translate it as something, a small portion. Something that the eye can see, the smallest thing that the eye can see. Allah says, I'll give you a method of ba'udah. Fama fawqaha. Or something that is greater. Now some will say greater means something that is a ba'udah or anything bigger than that. Some will say fawqaha means something even smaller than that. Tayyib. Now, here is where the Qur'an becomes a furqan. This will decide whether you are a mu'min or the way, whether you are a kafir. How? وَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا فَيَعْلَمُونَ إِنَّهُ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ As for those who believe, they know that this is truth. They know that this is a haq. They're happy. يستبشرون. When the ayah comes down, they're happy. They, they celebrate. وَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا فَيَقُولُونَ مَاذَا أَرَادَ اللَّهُ بِهَذَا مَثَلًا Isn't that what they say? Now, the translation is, the disbelievers say, what did Allah mean by this parable or this example? Now, and this is where the scholars come in. If I'm Talib al-Ilm, and Talib comes here and he gives a talk, and he comes and sits down after, I didn't understand something, I can go to Talib in a respectful manner, and I say, Habibi Talib, I didn't understand what you were talking about here. Can you please explain it to me? What did you mean by this example? And then he'll explain it. That's okay. In fact, we're encouraged to do this. But the kafirin, they did not say, Mada arad Allah bihada matal. They said, Mada arad Allah bihada matala. Which the tone suggests, what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala trying to do, giving an example of this? What is he trying to say? This doesn't even make sense. What, what, What's he trying to prove? This doesn't make any sense. So here you see that the kafirin, the, the reason why this Qur'an is a, a furqan and will decide if you are a mu'min or a kafir is not because Allah will try and misguide you or guide you, but because of your attitude to it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, يُضِلُّ بِهِ كَثِيرًا وَيَهْدِي بِهِ كَثِيرًا That same parable, that same example will either guide you or misguide you. Tayyib. So we see that the, the Quran here can either guide you or misguide you. Same thing with Al Hujjah, Ajullah Ta'ala Faraj Sharif. Or even Imam Ali. Didn't Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa say that whoever loves you is a believer? Or no one is, is, uh, loves you except that he is a believer. And no one hates you except that he is kafir or manafa. A disbeliever or a hypocrite. The same thing with a masjid, brothers and sisters. If we want to benefit from the masjid, now this place can be a place where it will give us blessings, where it will give, give us guidance, or it can be a place where it sends us even further into the hellfire. How? There's a story, also in al kafi Sharif, where there's two people who came in. A mu'min, and a fasaq, a believer, and one that commits a lot of sins. They come in. The one who is a mu'min, he stands in the mihrab and he prays the whole time, from fajr until maghrib. The sinner, he just sits in the corner over there, in the back corner next to the healer. That's all he does. Tayyib. Maghrib comes, they pray maghrib, and they leave. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that through this hadith that the one who came in as a believer left as a sinner and the one who sat in the corner next to the heater he left, he came in as a sinner, he left as a 
believer. Why? Because he says the intention of the one who came in as a believer, praying in front of everyone, was not for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal, but it was for the sake of boasting, boasting to the people around him, look at how, how much of a believer and a worshipper I am. You know, when you're praying at home, it's different. Your wudu is very quick. When you pray, you know, it's naked. You just tap your nose on the, the ard. But when you're here in the, in the masjid, and Talib Shaheen comes in, you say, oh, I want to impress Talib. Yani. Talib, Talib, come pray with me. You be my Imam. And then he finishes his prayers and he says, I'm just going to do my nawafin now. And he goes, goes to Ritzman and he says, I'm just going to do taraweh now, whatever you want to say. He continues to pray. Of course, taraweh is a bid'ah, so don't, you know, don't do that. I'm just giving an example. Whereas the other one who's sitting in the corner, all he did was sit in the corner. He did his, uh, his, his you know, Dukhul Maghrib Asha. And then he leaves. Of course, when we look at these people, sometimes they just sit in the corner. Maybe they're on their mobile phone. We say, look at this guy. What's he doing? Why is he wasting his time? He might as well go home. Go play, what is it? Clash of Clans at home or whatever it is. Why are you here at the masjid? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that his intention was not that he came here to boast to people. His intention was to come here and seek istighfar. He sat in that corner and all he could see was himself and Allah. That's all he saw. And he was seeking repentance for every sin that he was doing and then he left. So you see that this same masjid, this same masjid can cause us to, to reach nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or to move further away from him. And sometimes we are so simple minded, we're so quick to judge. We don't know the intention of the person, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. طيب. Now I was going to talk as well about the scholars. I think Talib spoke a bit too much. So the first we spoke about the masjid, we spoke about the Quran, but the scholars as well, they can be one that can lead us astray or to guide us. And it's not their fault. I might come here and speak, I'm not a scholar. But I might come here and speak, and one person will receive guidance from what I say, and another person, because of his attitude of what he's hearing, will say, you know, this is, this is kufr. And he comes out. He might be doing kufr upon truth. Or another alim comes and he shares a hadith. Sometimes they come and they share hadith, and we're so quick to say, what's this hadith? This Israeli hadith they entered into our books, so on and so forth. We don't have the right attitude because as soon as he comes up here, we're looking for a mistake that he's making. Now, there's many hadiths that I wanted to share, but there's one I really like from Imam Musa ibn Ja'far where he says, speaking to a scholar on a mezbele, you know, in a, in, in a garbage trash can, you know, in the streets where there's a lot of trash, Speaking to a scholar and learning from him and gaining nearness to him is much more preferred than talking rubbish in a big palace or a big mansion. Even a masjid. We can come here and we can talk about Musad Salahs and whatever. I think you mentioned one. I don't know which one you said. But you can come here. What is your purpose? Not to gain knowledge. This masjid is not supposed to be just so we come here and we feel good about ourselves. But it's so we benefit from it. We gain knowledge from it. Because if you're not going to come here and gain knowledge, it's much better that you go outside, near the mezabin, near the trash cans, and speak to a scholar and gain knowledge. Now, I'll, inshallah, I'll, um, I'll end it here. Um, I'll just share one more hadith. Where Imam al-Sadiq, he says, whoever acquires knowledge, and practices what he learns. I mean, we spoke about knowledge, but knowledge is just information. You know, I can come here, I can read ten books, and I come here and I say the, the same thing that the book said. But what am I doing? I'm doing taqlid of words. I'm just repeating like a parrot. But when I act upon it, that's when that knowledge becomes valuable. It's like a gem. The most valuable thing to a human being is knowledge. And he learned it. And then he teaches it to others for the sake of Allah. That person will be a great person among the angels in heaven. He learned for the sake of Allah. 
he practiced for the sake of Allah and he taught for the sake of Allah. So inshallah we can benefit from this masjid, we can benefit from our scholars and especially benefit after the month of Ramadan from this Quran that we, we gain knowledge, we practice it and we teach it to others inshallah. Salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Jazakallah khair, brother Ahmed. More information about the importance of uh, the masjid and how we should use it. And uh, your speech reminded me of uh, the lecture last night from uh, Sayyid Abu Bakr that we have to focus about the learning or the knowledge of Islam, not only on the worship, on the worship itself. Thank you very much, brothers, and thanks again for the brothers of uh, Beacon of Hope. And inshallah, we see them here again and again in this place, their place, our place, all inshallah. Uh, so we, might, we can make the, the, mo the most use of this place, inshallah. Wa aflaha wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Allah.